Ben here. Today, I have something that I am super excited about. It's the future of Home Assistant, and it's called Hass.io. Hey Google, talk to Hass.io. Sure, getting the test version of Hass.io. Hello, I'm Home Assistant. I can turn on lights or tell you any information Home Assistant has access to. But really, I'm just here to tell you that this took two minutes to set up. Hass.io brings some awesome new features to Home Assistant, which makes Home Assistant even easier to work with. If you're looking at getting started with home automation or are just looking for an easier home automation hub to work with, you're in the right place. I suppose if you're here, you probably already know what Home Assistant is, but I'm gonna reiterate it anyway. Home Assistant is one of the fastest growing home automation platforms and is definitely the biggest open source home automation platform. Its popularity is even starting to get to the point where it can give a commercial home automation platform like Samsung SmartThings a run for its money. Home Assistant, unlike SmartThings, is open source. And because of that, it's built by a community of developers who are all really excited to be building one of the best home controllers out there. Right now, Home Assistant supports over 740 components and counting. I'm not aware of any other home automation platform that supports anywhere close to that number of components. Home Assistant gives you the ability to link all of your devices and create really cool automations that otherwise would be pretty difficult to do. Looking for an easy way to link your Arlo camera motion detector to a light on your front porch? Easy. Want to dim that Philips Hue bulb when you start Chromecasting something? It's a piece of cake. If you're into home automation at all, then you're going to need a hub to control everything. And I think you should seriously consider Home Assistant. You may have noticed that there are a lot of different ways to install Home Assistant, even just on the Raspberry Pi. There's the all-in-one installer script, Haspian, you can install it straight from Python, and there's more I'm forgetting about. In the end, all of these installation methods install Home Assistant, but along with that, they install varying levels of supporting components like specific libraries or virtual environment or something. The cool thing about Hass.io is that it combines Home Assistant with a host controller and a supervisor layer. This lets it control the operating system and manage Docker containers. To the end user, that means that Home Assistant can now do things like natively restart your Raspberry Pi and manage the network and facilitate updates for not only Home Assistant, but for your operating system and the supervisor layer too. Aside from making life really, really convenient, this gives Hass.io the new ability to have modular components called add-ons. These allow Home Assistant to interface with other pieces of software and libraries and SDKs in a really easy and convenient way. Back in the day, which I guess was like a month ago, getting many of these components working with Home Assistant took a lot of command line work. But now it's as easy as a button click. Are you sold on Hass.io yet? Because you should be. Getting started is super easy. First, you'll need some hardware if you don't have it already. My recommendation is to use a Raspberry Pi 3 with a high quality SD card, a solid power supply, and a cheap case. This will probably set you back like 60 to 70 bucks, but it'll give you all of the memory and performance and reliability you need for any home automation adventure. Installing Hass.io is plug and play. From any computer, go to home-assistant.io forward slash Hass.io, and then go to the installation options. Click on the disk image for the device that you're going to use. Once that downloads, use an application like Etcher to write that disk image to the SD card. Then you just plug the imaged SD card into the Pi alongside a power and ethernet cable, and you just sit back. After a few minutes, you should be able to access the Home Assistant user interface from any computer that's on the same local network. To do this, you'll go to a web browser and type http colon forward slash forward slash hassio.local colon 8123. It's worth pointing out that the first time you fire up Hassio, it'll take about 20 minutes for it to download all of the dependencies that it needs to run Home Assistant. Once you're connected and it's finished loading, it should just drop you onto the main Home Assistant default view. Now, once you're connected, it's time to get oriented with Home Assistant. When you first log in, you'll probably see the cards that contain the various sensors and switches, which were automatically installed or discovered by Home Assistant on its first startup. You can use the groups and customize options to organize these as you'd like. 
You can create groups and tabs and assign different icons and names, and there's even themes now. In the top left, you'll see the hamburger icon. If you click that, it'll show the various components inside of Home Assistant. There's the map, which can display the location of connected devices. The logbook and history tabs can show you the state changes and trend data over time. The automation tab provides a simple user interface for creating automations in the Home Assistant front end. I still prefer to write my automations directly into the configuration file for now, but you could use this tool. Next, the configuration tab lets you move and rename groups and views. It also has several server management buttons for validating your configuration and restarting Home Assistant and parts of Home Assistant. On the very bottom, you have the developers tools. The remote icon on the left shows you all of the services that are enabled in your Home Assistant instance. When you go to write an automation or a script, like this one here, for example, that action is the service. You can use this tool to play with the parameters for each service to make sure they behave like you expect them to. To use a service, just select it from the dropdown list. The list that pops up underneath will show all of the valid parameters for that service. Using JSON formatting, you can enter any of those parameters for that service and just hit call service and see what it does. It's a great way to learn about Home Assistant. Next, there's the states tool. This is a really handy list that tells you all of the names for the items inside of Home Assistant and what their current state is. You'll reference this a lot when you're building an automation and when it asks for the entity ID that you want to turn on or turn off or whatever. Next is the events tool. This lets you fire events inside of Home Assistant. Honestly, I've rarely ever used this. The page icon is the template renderer tool. And this is an extremely useful thing that lets you play with templates. Templates inside of Home Assistant let you parse and manipulate data and apply logic to it in order to use that in another automation or sensor state or whatever. When I say that Home Assistant can do just about anything, it's because of these templating tools. For example, if for whatever reason you wanted to take a USGS river level forecast and turn a light red when the water level is getting too high, you can do that with templating. Don't let the syntax freak you out. You do a couple of these and you'll get the hang of it. Plus, it's very heavily documented and there's tons of examples and people in the Home Assistant community who will be willing to help you. And don't think I forgot. The last thing is the new HASIO tab. If you click on the handbag icon in the top right, you'll see a list of all the available add-ons to enhance Home Assistant. The first add-on you should install is a Samba Share. This lets you access your Pi's file structure as a network drive, so you can change your Home Assistant configuration settings. Once you install it, you can go to your network places, and you should see a new device called HASIO. If you click it, you should see a couple folders. Inside of the config folder, you should see the configuration.yaml file. This is the file that tells Home Assistant what components you're using, how they're organized, and then how to automate with them. You'll notice that there are different files for groups and automations. These are technically linked in the main configuration.yaml file, but they're broken out for simplicity. You can keep everything in the configuration.yaml file or break it up. There are great examples for both of these configuration schemes on the Home Assistant website. So you know, in the long run, Home Assistant hopes to move towards a graphical user interface for enabling and configuring components. But because that's a massive project and it'll take a serious amount of time, you should probably get used to looking at YAML for a little bit. YAML is just another markup language, and it's really easy to understand. Despite what a configuration file looks like, it's not coding. It's primarily a formatted list that tells Home Assistant what it needs to do. The most important thing to keep in mind when you're working with YAML is that white spaces matter. And if you don't use the right number in the right place, Home Assistant may not be able to deal with it. To make working with YAML easier, I'd recommend using an application like Notepad++ instead of just a normal text editor. You can set a cooler theme, control text wrapping, view white space, and make the font bigger so you don't go blind. Okay, so once you have Samba and Notepad++ set up, you can configure your first component. I want to set up Z-Wave. Z-Wave is a wireless protocol that I use to control various sensors and light switches in my house. I have an AOTech Z-Stick, which I compare to the devices, and then I just plug the Z-Stick into the Pi. Setting up Z-Wave and HASIO, like everything, is super easy. You just go to the configuration file, scroll to the bottom, copy and paste the code from the HASIO website, 
hit save, and then you're done. To make your changes become effective, you'll need to restart Home Assistant. Anytime you make a change to your configuration file, I would recommend clicking the Check Config button first. If you have a syntax error, it'll tell you, and you can fix it before it becomes a problem. If you didn't check the config, and you have a syntax error, and you restart Home Assistant, it could potentially crash on startup. Not all the time, but some conditions will. In that case, the user interface won't respond, and in general, it'll just seem like everything is dead. Your Samba share should still work, so you'll be able to go back and fix your code, but the problem is you won't be able to restart Home Assistant from the user interface. You'll have to either pull the plug or use the SSH add-on, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Assuming your code is good, you can hit restart, and after a few minutes, Home Assistant should come back up and Z-Wave should be ready to rock and roll. Then you just rinse and repeat this process for every other component you want to use with your Home Assistant instance. You copy the code from the components page into your configuration.yaml file, change the necessary bits, save your configuration, restart, and you're done. Okay, so the next thing you may want to do is to set up external network access. This will let you control your house securely from anywhere in the world. I won't go into excruciating detail on every step of this because this is all covered on the Home Assistant website and in previous videos. But at a very high level, the first thing you want to do is to set up a DNS service. This translates your public IP address into a readable URL, like hasioisawesome.duckdns.org. If you have a dynamic IP address, aka it changes randomly, you can use the DuckDNS add-on to periodically update your IP address in the DuckDNS servers. That way, if the IP address changes while you're away, you'll still be able to find your server. Next, you can set up SSL encryption. This will make all of the traffic that you send between your client devices and Home Assistant encrypted, so it's harder to snoop. First, you'll need to go into your router settings and go to your port forwarding rules. Create a rule to forward port 80 external to port 80 internal at your Pi's IP address. You'll need to do this for port 443 as well. Then install the Let's Encrypt add-on. This will issue the certificates that are needed for an encrypted setup. You'll need to provide an email address and the domain you plan on using in order for the certificate to be issued. After that's done, you'll just need to add the included lines to your configuration.yaml file and hit restart. By the way, at this point, it's not a bad idea to add a password to your Home Assistant instance too. As a heads up, after you set up Let's Encrypt, you'll only be able to access Home Assistant using HTTPS rather than HTTP. If you try to connect your Home Assistant front end using an HTTP URL, it won't connect. And just like that, you're off and running with an easily accessible, secure home automation hub. What's really cool though is what Hasio lets you do next. Check out some of these add-ons. One awesome one that a lot of people know is for the MQTT broker called Mosquito. MQTT is a super lightweight protocol for communicating between IoT devices. I use it for all of my DIY projects, like my first blinds and sensor nodes and RGB LEDs, uh, my upcoming blinds, displays, really any chance I can. Installing it is as easy as clicking a button. You can add a username and password if you want. Once it's up, you can access it on port 1883. There's a really cool Chrome plugin called MQTT Lens that lets you track things on your MQTT broker really easily so you don't need the command line utilities anymore. Another cool add-on is the one for Google Assistant. This lets you turn your Raspberry Pi into a DIY Google Home using a mic and a speaker. Hey Google, turn on the Hue Go light. You got it, turning the Hue Go on. Hey Google, turn off the Hue Go light. Sure, turning off the Hue Go. Hey Google, set the Hue Go light to red. Okay, changing the Hue Go to red. The documentation is spot on, so I'm not going to cover it in detail, but once you're done, you can connect it with API AI and trigger custom intents inside of Home Assistant. It's pretty slick. And speaking of voice control, Home Assistant now has a ton of options for using voice control with it. There's the emulated hue component, which is super easy to set up and allows you to control the lights and switches inside of Home Assistant from either an Amazon Echo or Google Home. There's also Haska, Snips, and a native conversation component. I'll be coming back to these pretty soon in a follow-up video, so stay tuned. Another great add-on is the SSH add-on, which lets you connect to your Pi's command line interface. This can be really useful if you get into a pickle and you're unable to restart Home Assistant. You'll need to enable the component and then generate a private key using PuttyGen. 
Once you get the private key, you can paste that into the add-on and then hit restart. To connect to your Pi's command line, you can use PuTTY, you link the key, type in your Pi's IP address, use port 22, the username is root, and then you just hit enter and you're off and running. There's a really simple command line interface, which you can access by typing in hasio help and then pressing enter. This will let you view the error logs and restart Home Assistant if it's crashed. Now, one of my favorite new features of HassIO has to be the new snapshot backup feature. You can access it in the HassIO panel by clicking the three dots in the top right hand corner. It lets you super easily back up your entire Home Assistant instance. It backs up your entire configuration, your enabled add-ons, your Home Assistant version, and all of the data. It even lets you restore your setup on a different architecture than it was created on. So you can start on a Pi Zero, and then if you need more power later, you can just transfer that snapshot image to the Pi 3, and everything will be just like you left it. Those saved snapshots are available through the Samba share, so you can easily copy and paste them between devices and keep a backup on a separate device in case your Pi fails. Right now, snaps are a global operation, but I've been told that the ability to do a partial backup and a partial recovery is coming in future updates. Oh yeah, did I mention that Hasio also supports third-party add-ons too? There's already some really cool ones like a Homebridge add-on that'll let you interface iOS devices into Home Assistant. There's also the Has Configurator, which adds a really cool web-based text editor to edit your Home Assistant configuration without needing Samba or Notepad++. And for the intense people, the App Daemon add-on. App Daemon is a process which runs in the background, collecting information from Home Assistant and feeding that into custom Python snippets. This allows you to execute some very powerful automations using simple amounts of coding logic. Home Assistant can do a ton on its own, but App Daemon is another tool that you can use to take things to the next level if you want. Man, did I miss anything? Hasio really, really, really steps up the game for Home Assistant. It lowers the bar for entry to almost nothing and easily makes Home Assistant the simplest open source home automation hub to get started with. Personal biases aside, I feel like when you combine all of these new add-ons with the 700 plus other components that Home Assistant already supports, I don't think you're going to find a more capable home automation controller anytime soon. As always, thanks much to all the developers who spent ages working on these projects. They are the ones that are pushing the ball forward in a major kind of way. What do you guys think about this? Are you as excited as I am? If you haven't yet, be sure to hit that subscribe button. I'm pumped. There are a lot of videos in the works, so stay tuned. Till then, happy automating.